This video has been sponsored by Star Trek Fleet Command, the constantly evolving 4X MMO strategy game available on iOS, Android and PC for free. Use the link in the description to play the new Strange New Worlds content arc, featuring weekly narrative missions launching alongside the episodes of the fantastic Paramount Plus show. These will be available through a new feature, the holodeck. As well as giving access to the new missions, this building will also allow you to revisit past missions and story arcs from the years of award-winning content the game offers. That's not all though, as a number of brand new officers straight from Strange New Worlds are arriving in-game for you to staff your ships with. Captain Christopher Pike and Lieutenant Spock and La'an Nunian Singh. Also joining them will be the fan favourite Reginald Barkley, though he will be a PC exclusive for one month before heading to mobile. Expanded research and a number of shiny new customization options also wait for you in the new update for Star Trek Fleet Command. It's available to play for free on iOS, Android and PC through the link in the description below. Hello everyone, I'm Hujiwana and this is Space Talk. Today we're talking about one of the major influences on fictional spacecraft design and narratives, submarines. Now there's a lot of very naval things across most spaceship sci-fi, so what elements cross over with submarines specifically? Quite a lot really, the most obvious being that both are fully enclosed pressure vessels with self-contained life support systems, but at least subs can return to the surface for air. Both also have to rely heavily on sensors and scopes to see, though you can see a lot further in space than underwater. They can also be very cramped inside, but this doesn't come up quite as much in spacecraft for whatever reason, except for in fighters, but that's a whole other thing. That covers the very basics of the similarities, but the inspiration for stories and ship design often goes far deeper than those surface elements. This most recently occurred in the fourth episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and if you want to avoid spoilers for it, then you can skip ahead to this timestamp on screen right now. If you're still here, the Enterprise was attacked by a powerful assailant who took them by surprise, forcing them to hide in the atmosphere of a brown dwarf, which was essentially analogous to a murky underwater environment. The pressure of the depths of the atmosphere damaged the ship, and even managed to completely crumple one of their opponents, while the other was destroyed by dropping a torpedo on them, a bit like a depth charge. Earlier on, Spock had modified their navigational systems to give a crude method of tracking their pursuers through the thick clouds. This interface is more like old school radar than sonar, but we'll get into that a bit more later. Interestingly, the sweeping rings for this system were directly inspired by the Dradis interface from Battlestar Galactica. Galactica itself has a ton of obvious naval influence, especially from aircraft carriers, but there's a few things that are much more submarine-like, particularly in the miniseries. The scene where Galactica has to go down the small route to reach Ragnar Anchorage is practically lifted straight from The Hunt for Red October. We love this movie here at Space Dock, and it's one of the three recommendations Daniel provided in the How to Write a Space Battle video, which you can go watch by clicking the thingy on the right. The film is a masterpiece of tension, with everything being about the captains of the vessels, how they plan and manoeuvre, their decisions and responses, and how they try to outsmart opponents even if they don't know if they're really there. There's even technical elements to it, such as dangerous systems failing to function and their effects on the crew. I know you all love technical stuff like that. Speaking of which, these displays with a line going up the middle that Jonesy uses are what actual passive sonar looks like. Smarter Every Day has an excellent video explaining just how that works, and it's very much not like how any spacecraft sensors are shown. The exception is active sonar, which works in a similar manner to radar. The movie also has a few other things that demonstrate just how similar subs and spacecraft are, such as a mini submarine moving sideways and even docking with another ship. The various interiors of the subs could straight up be used in Battle Stars, apart from maybe the fake wooden panels on the Red October. There's even an Enterprise, which brings us right back to Star Trek, but this time the Deep Space Nine episode Starship Down, which featured the Defiant, a civilian cargo ship, and a pair of Jem'Hadar attack ships playing submarine hide and seek in the atmosphere of a gas giant. The thick clouds created interference with the sensors and weapons guidance, forcing the crew of the Defiant to come up with simplistic, improvised ways of seeing and dealing with the Jem'Hadar. Originally, the intent was to have this episode actually occur underwater, but this wasn't possible due to budget constraints, which is why the gas leak into the ship feels a bit contrived. 
So that's two submarine episodes of Star Trek, but the influences subs had on the franchise started much earlier. Khan Noonien Singh first appeared on the Botany Bay, which very much looks like a submarine. Fifteen years after that episode of the original series, the final confrontation in The Wrath of Khan involved a few more submarine tropes. It takes place in the Mutara Nebula, another way of limiting sensors and injecting some tension into the battle as the Reliant and Enterprise hunt for each other. Kirk outsmarts Khan due to using the Z-axis in a setting that typically has everything meeting each other on the same plane, essentially mimicking submerging and reappearing behind a surface vessel. So it is possible for Star Trek to use proper three-dimensional movement, but only in the context of a huge set piece at the end of a movie. I don't have some clever segue here, so enjoy this sudden lurch over to Halo's Strident class. I covered this recently in our Infinity class breakdown as one of its deployable frigates, and it became one of my favourite ships in Halo thanks to all the little details it has, like having installation points for shield tech that wasn't ready yet, and the oversized armament with limited ammunition. Interestingly, the enormous Hyperion nuclear missiles the class carries were so big, the writers for Halo Warfleet struggled with trying to plausibly fit the things into the ship. They eventually figured out a way to launch and load them that was inspired by the Soviet Juliet-class submarine. The Strident still looks like a standard UNSC ship though, unlike the Anlace class which at least looks vaguely submarine-like due to its concessions to aerodynamics and dark hull colour. The Ranger class from Battlestar Galactica Deadlock is another design that is very much submarine inspired. Not only is it much more narrow than many other colonial ships, but it even has what looks like a conning tower on its dorsal surface. Weirdly though, what guns it has are focused more on its ventral side, leading it to flying above the enemy if it wants to put out the most damage, which I suppose is because dorsal guns would have spoiled its relatively clean lines. The other submarine-style vessel the Colonials have access to is the Orion class, but that uses its stealth systems to get an upper hand over the Cylons, rather than looking like a sub. Its super-reflective surface is actually the exact opposite of what you'd want for stealth though, as that just makes it far easier to see. Low observability in real life is achieved through absorbing or redirecting sensor signals, not bouncing them really efficiently back to their source. That said, the Orion in Deadlock is at least most efficient when opponents are above it, leading it to it feeling a little more like a sneaky sub manoeuvring below the enemy. Star Wars The Clone Wars had a very sneaky space sub in the Season 2 episode Cat and Mouse, where Anakin used it to attack the flagship of Admiral Trench, who was leading a blockade of the planet Christosis. Trench launched a number of torpedoes that tracked the magnetic signature of the stealth ship, which is a real thing that can be used to track real submarines. Unfortunately for him, Anakin was an exceptionally skilled pilot and baited the torpedoes right into the bridge of Trench's ship, a tactic that seems to be straight from the hunt for Red October. These are just some examples of subs in space that I happen to know about, but hopefully it's enough to demonstrate the similarities between a vessel that operates underwater and one in vacuum. Space warfare in fiction has taken many cues from naval battles of the 20th century, including underwater combat, but what it might end up really being like is going to be far different to what we might expect. However, using elements the audience knows and is familiar with helps to ground things, and allows them to really connect with the story.